Uh, my name is Karin Astega and I will chair this session on supported decision making and personal budgets. I want to give you some information on the format of our session. It's a participatory session. That means that we will have some additional accessibility support here today. Uh, and this will work in the following way. Um, each of the speakers will give his or her presentation and after each presentation, Petra, who works over there, she will give us a short summary in easy language and with graphical uh, support. So all of us are very committed to timekeeping and we try our best that in the end of the session you will have some minutes to ask your questions and, and make some remarks. And now I would like to invite our speakers to shortly introduce themselves before we start with the presentations. So Mats, could you please start with briefly introducing yourself? Thanks. Yes, my name is uh, Mats. Yes, Poson. I'm from Sweden. I'm the founder of this personal ombudsman system, and it's the fourth time I presented on a zero conference, zero project conference, the, the seventh time here in Vienna at all. Thank you very much. Jotam? Hello, my name is Jotam Tolub, and I am from Israel. I am the head of uh, Bizchut, which is a uh, uh, organization for the rights of people with disability. Thank you. Hi, I'm Avital sandler Leff, and I'm uh, the director of uh, JDC Israel Unlimited, which is a strategic partnership between JDC, the government of Israel, and the Ruderman Family Foundation. And I'm also overseeing the issue of uh, disabilities in JDC worldwide. We work in 70 countries around the world, and we try to make them as inclusive as possible. Thank you. Nicholson, and I'm from Australia, and I'm the founder and trainer of Supported Decision Making, and I'm today going to be talking about the transferability of the work in Japan. Hello, and I'm Linda Perry from Canada, and I am the executive director of Vela Canada, which is a small nonprofit that does community development to support people to create a life that's self-determined. Thank you very much. So, Mats, could you please start your presentation about the personal ombudsman? That's the, how do I move the, the technical thing? How do I move the images? Oh, here it is. Oh, okay. Yes. So, I will tell you a little about our service, PO Skone. And PO is a short form of personal ombudsman, and Skone is a province in the southern part of Sweden, with about 1.1 million inhabitants. So, our service has uh, become well known all over, all over the world, uh, especially in connection with the UN Convention on the Rights for Persons with Disabilities. And our service is, for example, presented in the World Report on Disability, published by the World Health Organization and the World Bank in 2011. I just show this slide to give a little image of how the interest is around the world. So I presented it in 17 countries in Europe and two in South America. And the next week I'm going to present it in Tokyo. So it's the first time in Asia. Uh, so, and it's, uh, yes, it's much connected to this Article 12 on legal capacity as many countries are uh, considering the option of abolishing their old guardianship systems and replacing it with some form of supported decision making. So, first I give you a, will give you a short definition of what a personal ombudsman is. A PO is a professional, highly skilled person who works to 100%, not 95% or 97% or 99%, but to 100% on the commission of his client, clients only. The PO is in no alliance with psychiatry or the social services or any other authority, and not with the client's relatives or any other person in his or her surroundings. The PO does only what his clients want him to do, as it can take a long time, sometimes several months, before the client knows and dares to tell what kind of help he wants. The PO 
has to wait, even though a lot of things are chaotic and in a mess. This also means that the, the PO has to develop a long-time engagement for his clients, usually for several years. This is a necessary condition for developing a trustful relation and for coming into more essential matters. Actually, our service started 10 years before the UN Convention was adopted in another context, namely the experience of us who are users and survivors of psychiatry and our ideas and experience of the support we, th we think we may might need in certain situations. The Swedish system with personal ombudsmen came out of the Swedish psychiatric reform in 1995. Now, uh, 24 years later, we have in Sweden 310 personal ombudsmen in the whole country that provide support to decision making for more than 6,000 individuals. 245 municipalities, which is 84% of all municipalities in Sweden, include peers in the social service system. And in 2013, we got a new regulation that includes the peer system in the regular welfare system. The PO system is actually also saving huge sums of money for the government. Studies show that PO operations reduce costs by approximately 80,000 euros per assisted person over a five-year period. For every euro the government spends on the PO system, they gain 17 euros, so it's also good business. So the government is not spending money, as they think, and they are saving money. And that is a good argument when you're trying to convince politicians. So, the municipalities can choose to run their peer services themselves or contract, contract some NGO, like our organization, who can run it for them. We think it's important that the peer service is independent from the government to avoid conflicts of interest and to gain trust from the persons who need the service most. Oh, that's another one. In our service with personal ombudsmen, the most important thing has been to develop ways to work which are adjusted to persons with mental health problems of the most difficult kind. And with this, I mean persons who live entirely in a symbolic world, or living homeless in the streets, or living barricaded in their apartments. So I will briefly introduce some preconditions that you think are necessary if you really want to reach the per these persons and practice support the decision making with them. Very shortly, the PO doesn't work Monday to Friday at office hours only. The PO hasn't got any office because office is power. The PO works from his own home with the help of telephone and internet and he meets his or her clients in their home or at neutral places out in town. Uh, there should be no bureaucratic procedure to get a person ombudsman. If a form had to be signed or, or, or an admission note be necessary, many psychiatric patients would back out and not get the PO. And it would probably be the persons who need a PO most. To get a PO from PO Skåne doesn't involve any formal procedure. After a relationship is established, the PO just asks, do you want me to be your PO? If the answer is yes, the whole thing is settled. And it could be counseled just as easy. A PO should be well skilled to be able to argue effectively for the client's rights in front of various authorities or in court. All personal ombudsmen of PO Skåne have some kind of academic degree from the university or some similar education. Most of them are trained social workers, but some are lawyers and some have other specialized training. The PO doesn't keep any records. All papers belong to the client. When the relation is terminated, the PO has either to give all papers to the client or burn them together with the client. No paper and no notes will remain with the PO. So what you now see in, the, in this is uh, that in 2017, our service was, with personal ombudsmen was supplemented with a new service called, in Swedish, BSAM, 
which translated into English means self-determination coordinator. Like the person and ombudsman, the BSAM supports persons with psychosocial disabilities in making their own decisions and to communicate their decisions to others, but more as small collectives than as individuals. The, the BSAM mainly support persons who are living in sheltered living to support their way to argue against the staff. And like the personal ombudsman, the BSAM is a former psychiatric patient with special skills for this task. But she is employed and working full time just as the personal ombudsman. Oh, that is that. Okay. Uh, at the moment, Pio Skone has 19 personal ombudsmen, one self determination coordinator, and one director working full time. They are employed by a board with representatives from a user organization and a family organization. PU Skone is an NGO in itself, but it is owned by these two other NGOs and therefore user run. And here you can see some of the personal ombudsmen. I think. Thank you very much, Mats, for sharing. Yes, thanks very much for sharing again and also for, for giving us this very interesting update on the BISAM, a new kind of service, uh, which sounds very, very interesting. So Petra, are you ready to give us your first summary? Yes, please. Okay, uh, welcome to the next session. Um, this is all about, um, I'll just repeat the title, you don't have to show it on the camera, Supported Decision-Making and Personal Budget Models. And we will see a few examples of how people with disabilities are being supported so they make their own decisions versus others are deciding for me. Um, there are all kinds of examples we will be hearing about. The first one that we have heard here on the conference many times already um, is the Swedish model of the personal ombudsman. And... Um, we heard again that what's really important about a personal ombudsman is that this person has no hidden agenda. He or she will do 100% of uh, the, their commission of the client. So the, in the center of the interest of this uh, ombudsman is the p person with a disability. And I'm sorry if I always try to draw somebody in a wheelchair. <laughs> of course, we know that here on the conference we talk about all kinds of disabilities, but I have to be quick in the drawing, so I'm sorry about that. Um, we also heard that it is very easy to communicate and to choose an ombudsman, which is very um, interesting because I can meet this ombudsman wherever I like as a person with disability. I don't have to go to an office, which could be offensive for me. I drew a coffee, <laughs> um, very Viennese, maybe in Vienna we would meet for coffee. And um, all you have to do is say yes. You meet the person and then you say, yes, I want to work with you. And then um, the PO will do everything together with me and in my interest. And one example you also mentioned is that um, my papers belong to me. So um, the PO will not keep any of, of the notes after the... Um, the partnership is finished and you also said they might even be burnt. Yeah, they have to be, the decision is up to the person, right? And um, one thing I also heard was as an as a argument for governments maybe, if they put in one euro to that project, they actually gain 17 euros. This is supposed to be a little pig where you can save money. Um, so it's also um, a financial advantage for governments. That's hopefully the basic message, but um, there's a lot more to your project, as we know. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Petra. So now we come to Yotam and Israel, and in the preparation of this session, I learned that Mats and Yotas, uh, Yotam know each other, and I think Yotam did what we are all doing when we attend this conference. He looked at existing good practice when he wanted to set up his own services or improve them. So Jotam, please tell us what is the result of your studies. Thank you very much. So I wanna, I wanna continue on that tone and say that um, uh, I think five years ago, something like that, I, I was looking around the world for examples and all the arrows uh, pointed me to maths in Sweden and I spent four days in Skane 
and received a private lesson from Matt. And a lot of my knowledge and, um, and my thoughts on supported decision making were, um, were extremely um, uh, influenced by Matt. So thank you very much. And it's an honor to be sitting right next to you. Okay, <laughs> so let's jump in. So I call this prison break. Um, um, throughout the, I'm a lawyer, and uh, part of my work was uh, representing people with disabilities who've been under guardianship. And um, when I think of the metaphor that I've heard the most uh, when people were talking about their life under guardianship, we, we know that some, sometimes people use civil death, um, but what I heard the most was prison. I'm living in a prison without walls, without physical restraints, but I feel that I am in a prison. I am, uh, and I want to break free. Um, and I don't know how many of you remember the TV show Prison Break. Uh, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. You're not only promoting disability rights, you're also watching TV. Uh, so, so right in Prison Break, what we have is someone who in order to help his brother get out of prison, he, he, he commits a crime to go into the jail and he has a tattoo of all the structure of the jail on his body so he can find his way out, right? Um, so I find that metaphor useful uh, in two ways. One is something I learned from math that if you want to help someone uh, to break free, you need to go inside. Um, but the other one is that you need to understand the structure of the prison. You need to understand the structure of guardianship. And, um, and Dana helped me understand that. Um, Dana, is, um, Dana is the first person in Israel who um, was able to go out of guardianship and into supported decision making. She's, actually, she's the first person in Israel who was under supported decision making. And when Dana approached Bizchut, uh, her parents passed away, she inherited um, money, and she spent a lot of it very quickly. And so everyone was sure that what she needed was a guardian. And at the age of uh, 37, something like that, she found herself inside that prison. Um, her parents didn't think she needed a guardianship. She wasn't under guardianship when they were alive. Um, but that was the solution the surrounding uh, thought was the best for her. And, um, and, and, and she felt that imprisonment in many ways, one of them that I will share here, and you can read more about it in the book, the Zero Project book, um, is that she wanted a dog. And she actually had a dog for a few days, and then her guardians took, her, took the dog away and said, it's too, it's too complicated for you. You're not gonna be able to, to take care of the dog. So that was one of her dreams, to have a dog. And she had many other dreams that um, she needed money in order to fulfill those dreams. And, um, and she was on, behind these walls. And so uh, Dana approached us and we uh, helped her go to court. And, and, and one, of, one of the things I learned from that is you need to do everything right and then you need a lot of luck. Because we fell on a good judge that was happy to go along this adventure because we, don't have, we didn't have an Israeli law supported decision making. And we came, we said, listen, there's the CRPD, that was the first time the judge heard about the CRPD, and it talks about supported decision making, let's appoint her a supported decision making. And the judge said, all right, let's go with that. And we found someone, an accountant, Dana actually found the accountant, someone she didn't know before, who agreed to be her supported decision making. And that's it, and she was free, and she got the dog, and you can see more about that in YouTube. You can write Bishchut Article 12 and see her story and many other stories. But then one day, uh, her supporter calls me and says, listen, Dada wants to, to sell her house, and it's a bad decision, and I told her no. And then I understood that you can replace, replace the name Guardian and call him supporter decision making, but you can't replace that paternalism that fast. And you can call someone a support decision making, but if you don't, support a decision maker, but if you don't teach this new thing, this new uh, philosophy, then we'll find new guardians under disguise. And that's when we 
decided uh, to do a pilot and try to develop our model in the Israeli context of supported decision making. I won't be talking too much about this, um, the details of the, of the pilot. I want, I want to focus on the, what we learned from the pilot. But basically what we did is we, we recruited 11 supporters. We said whoever wants in the city of Jerusalem to be under support decision making can apply. All disabilities, all ages, all situations of life, uh, 22 people who received the support. And what did we learn at the end of the pilot, which is all in an English published model um, that uh, is on the internet. Um, so I'll, I'll go through a few of the, the things we learned. The first one is that it's irrelevant almost to talk about support, supporting someone to express their will or to uh, found, find out what is their will if you're not supporting also the exercise of the will. Um, and when it goes to exercising of the will, it becomes more complicated because it's not just happening in the relationship between the person and his supporter. It's going to the bank. It's going to receive different kind of services and um, bureaucracy and a lot of other issues. But if you want to be giving good support to people to live independent lives, we have to be supporting also the execution. The other one, I'm not sure everyone will agree with me on that, but I think it's not rocket science. It's not rocket science, it's not that complicated. You don't have to have, not a PhD, and I think not also uh, 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 many years of uh, professional training in order to be a supporter. And that's also something I learned from Matt, uh, because I saw that his supporters were coming from many different kind of, um, of professions. But you need to have the right mindset. And to take paternalism out of someone is very hard. And therefore, recruiting supporters that are with a free spirit or with true belief that people can make decisions over their life, that is something um, that is harder and is very important. I'm going to skip to the two last ones. No man is an island. All right. If you want to have a good uh, chance of someone making decisions over his life, uh, it means you have to have the support uh, of a wider network. Uh, where the parents are for it, it's going to work. When the parents don't believe in it, it's going to probably fail or it's going to be very complicated. Uh, what we found out is a lot of times the most difficult issues were not with the person with the disabilities and not with the supporter, but with the surroundings, uh, with the close surroundings and a lot of doubts they had on it. And the last one, which I find extremely important, uh, at least in our context, is that harm is overrated. A lot of time when you talk about taking away the guardianship regime and setting people free, um, people talk about harm all the time. And, and being with these people and supporting them, we saw that harm wasn't the main issue. Many other issues were there. But people don't run to the street. People don't uh, spend all their money. Um, there are other issues to be addressed. And I'll finish with this, um, and my time's up, so I'll just say that uh, two years later, the people who participated in the pilot went to the Israeli parliament and changed the law. And now in Israeli law, we have supported decision making, and it's supposed to be the first step before you get to guardianship, and hopefully we'll have more and more people being supported. Thank you very much. Thanks to Jotam for making uh, this prison of guardianship and also the development of supported decision-making services in Israel so tangible for us. It was getting very strong message over for me. Thank you. Petra, ready? Yeah. The prison break, right? Um, so I guess we all know that. I know from Austria people keep saying similar things. Uh, once you're under guardianship, it feels like a prison and you call the project a prison break. Um, I'll start with the end. You said at the end um, you have a new law now in Israel, so that was a big result of what you did. Um, and the project was to come up with supported decision making instead of, instead of guardianship. Um, one of the challenges that I heard was that um, you can exchange the guardian with uh, somebody who is taking um, paternalism as a, as a focus. And that's what you focused on uh, to get that out of the supporters. 
if I understand it correctly. So the supporting people uh, must understand that the person who is making her or his own decision is able to do so, and it's their, their choice. Um, and you said you need to do the things right, but you also need luck. You, had a, you were lucky you had a good um, lawyer, or um, was it lawyer? Yeah. Um, so with, with a little bit of luck, it was not the lawyer, it was a, whatever. A the, thank you, accountant. Um, so do the right thing, but also you need a little bit of luck and probably the right people involved. And from the whole process that took a while, you learned some things. And one of them was to find the will of the person. I always draw a little star <laughs> to show it's a wish, you know, like the North Star where I can find my way. So know what the person wants, but also support the execution of what the person wants. So not leave them alone with finding their wishes, but assisting to make it happen. Um, you said um, it's not a rocket science. Um, everybody can do supported uh, decision making as long as it's within the framework. No man is an island. So um, from how I would translate it is that involve families, friends, supporters, make sure that they all participate in the whole process. And harm is overrated. Um, so most of these guardianship things and also supportive uh, people keep saying, no, oh, the person might have big harm, like the, uh, the sorry, uh, what you told us about the dog of the lady. Um, harm is overrated. And so if we take these learnings, um, maybe we can transfer that to other countries. So thank you for that. Thanks a lot, Petra. So now we stay in Israel, and Avital will now tell us uh, about an important pilot project they did in Israel and what her country is planning to do in the future. Please, Avital. Thank you. So as we all know, we all have the same needs. We want to work, to love, to have a roof beyond our heads, to have meaningful relationships. But this is not how the uh, system of services works. Uh, in Israel and in many other places in the world, uh, people get services according to their kinds of disabilities, their type of disabilities, or their age, or the severeness of their disabilities. And our goal is to change the system, not only to pilot, because uh, this is how JDC works with our partners from the government and from the foundations, and we have here the Ruderman Family Foundation and the Ted Arison Family Foundation, so thank you for your support. And the idea is, once the uh, program is proven successful, the government, who is committed to this pilot, will uh, adopt it and change the way and change their mindset and change the way they deliver services. And here we have still a long way to go, but we are starting this, uh, uh, this way with this successful uh, pilot. Two, in 2012, we came to the government, we said, let's try it, let's uh, follow our colleagues in the States and in uh, Western Europe and adopt this model of looking at the person, looking at what he needs rather than the kinds of disability he has and tailor made the services he needs in order to get there or, or um, uh, fulfill the star that we just, uh, the dream uh, that we've just uh, spoke about. Um, the government said, like the, the heads of the government said, no way, forget about it. People will, uh, will cheat the system. It will cost way too much. It will cost much more than you already pay. So we brought, uh, you, we have some people here in the room, Professor Steve Edelman, we took uh, the, uh, our senior government people to meet with uh, Sue Swenson, who is also in the room uh, from the States and uh, from the, uh, she was back there in, in the federal government and we told them, look, we are not the only one who is doing it. There are great, uh, there are great success around the world. Let's try to adapt it. And that's what we did. And the reason we did it, we also showed the government that the results of what's going on with people with disabilities in Israel in the macro level is not that great. We have only 51% of people with disabilities working. It may not sound so 
um, so bad, but the quality of their work and their, their way uh, to uh, achieve their goals in life is very, very limited. There are 30 percent of people with disabilities live under the poverty line. Uh, we are still way behind the states in uh, promoting independent living and living, moving out from institutions towards the community. We're starting to get there, but we're not there yet. So the way the system works now actually costs a lot and doesn't bring the right support to the person and let him fulfill his dreams and the way he wants to live. So what we've done is, and Yotam was one of, of our uh, consultants, so, and he consulted with Matt, so we, we're all connected here. And uh, so we said, let's try. Uh, let's give it a try. And we adopted the American model, and we've set, a, uh, we've set a pilot where a person and his family can get a care coordinator. They also meet not in an office, wherever the person wants. It can be in a coffee shop, it can be on the beach, wherever the person thinks it's the best, uh, it's the best uh, setting for him or her. Uh, we, the first thing we do is we dream with our partners with disabilities. We dream about what do they want to do when they'll, be, when they'll uh, get old, and uh, we start thinking how to get there. And the idea is to look at the main achievements in life like we all look at our lives. Again, employment, work, love, meaningful uh, relationship, being able to practice their uh, religion. And we work also with the Arab community. By the way, we believe that peace will come from people with disabilities because you bring them together and they all have the same challenge. And we, of course, the pilots are um, implemented in all sectors of society in Israel. And once they've decided what they want, we have allocations for them uh, to fulfill their dreams. If we can connect them to existing services, we do that, and we educate this, uh, the providers of the services how to cater for those, uh, uh, for those individuals. And if not, we are tailor, we are, we are um, uh, doing it creatively in the community. And I'll give you some examples uh, later on. Uh, the idea is uh, to look, and we did a research, uh, checking how much the government spent on people with disabilities today before implementing these uh, models, and we already see that it cost about 20% or 30% less than the original uh, model that the government already knows how to fund. And this will help us, the economical uh, research will help us convince the parliament people and the decision makers to implement this, uh, this pilot because it's not only bettering the life of people with disabilities and help them fulfill their dreams, uh, but it also costs less. And the idea is that uh, two persons who have the same kind of disability can have a totally different uh, basket of services because they want to live a different lifestyles like we all, uh, we all do. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, our work now is to, uh, we measure, 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 and uh, we are working closely with our policymakers in order to uh, make it happen in, uh, in I hope, the, the plan is that in 2021, the pilot will be uh, sustained by the government and expanded. And uh, in order to get there, we need again to educate because we already educated and, and got consensus from our uh, main policy makers, but now we have to go to the service providers, to the families, to those who were educated to get the services in the old fashioned way. And you also need to uh, help them believe that they can dream and they can do whatever they want with their life. Uh, what motivates us is uh, stories of success like uh, Yotam shared with us. We have people who got married, we have people who are living, who moved out from institutions and, and live by themselves. We have people that uh, with this kind of support have managed to establish their own business and managed to, uh, um, to uh, become part of their uh, synagogue or part of their mosque and, and create a meaningful, uh, great life like we all want for ourselves. 
And it's also uh, goes, for, uh, it's very connected to supported decision making because we understand that one of the barriers is working with the families and working with the guardianships who also, who sometimes think that this program will do harm like Yotam said. So in parallel to this program, at, uh, at, the, at April, we'll start um, a supported decision-making um, pilot following the legislation that Bishkut uh, led in, uh, in the Israeli parliament. So we believe that those three, uh, uh, that the three elements of uh, personal budget, budgeting, changing the system towards that, uh, supported decision making and educating people with disabilities by uh, themselves that they can and they should have the life that they dream of will make the revolutions we want to be we want to create thank you I'm, um, Petra is not the only one drawing pictures today, so thanks a lot, Avital, for, for really completing uh, this picture that Jotam started to draw about the Israeli situation and, and for uh, explaining in such a, a concrete way how those things are interconnected and how important they are for persons with support needs to really live fulfilled lives the way they wish. Thank you very much. And now Petra will... Uh, give us a summary again. <laughs> yes, very well connected, all the topics, of course. Um, the person-centered services uh, pilot project we heard of, again, we are saving money here. So to all the governments out there, listen. Um, and um, what the person-centered services do is instead of looking, as, as it has been done by now, looking at what does the person not do um, and switch the narrative and look at, again, wishes, needs and um, parts of being uh, part of the society. So it's all about what does the person really need and then you came up with a um, care coordinator as a solution and um, together with the care coordinator we see a similar solution that we heard before. It's all about the dreams and wishes of the person that have to be determined and then again there has to be like an action plan towards the goals and you see how to get there. Um, it involves that this core uh, care coordinator meets up with the person and then they find out how does the person want to live, how does the person want to work, um, how does the person have meaningful relationships, where does he or she belong. And it's all embedded within the community. And what we see from your project is that the community and especially the service providers are being educated. And... Um, your goal is to have by 2021, yeah, to have it government-based, not not a pilot project anymore, but to bring it into life. And what I drew here is, um, this is supposed to be a, a service provider who says, "Aha, I got it. I understood it. I'm I'm now doing it the way you're suggesting." Yeah, that's um, a short summary. Thank you. Thanks again, Petra. So now we are leaving Israel and we are moving on to Canada. <laughs> and Linda will tell us about uh, their approach, the so-called microboards approach, which are personally chosen small support networks. And Linda will explain us how that works. Thanks. What am I doing wrong here? There we go. Um, hello. Yes, just to clarify to begin with what a microboard is, um, Normally when I start this topic and explain the definition, a lot of people have assumed it's a computer program, but we actually recently with one of our, our funders, let me explain quickly, it's not a computer program. One of our funders, the accounting department actually called me and asked me why they should be funding skateboards, which I thought was a very different take on microboard. They were thinking it was a small skateboard, which is a bit alarming in social services that they thought they were actually providing money for a skateboard. But anyway, we have nothing to do with skateboards unless people are interested in using them that happen to have a microboard. The idea of a microboard is it's a very tiny not-for-profit um, Oh, entity. So it's what we call in Canada a simple nonprofit. They're not charities because this isn't about charity work, but they're little tiny um, NGOs set up around one person or one family. Everybody that sits on the board must be in relationship with the person or family that it's established for. And that person will have chosen those people. 
So we don't see microboards that are set up for an individual and they're strangers to that person. As part of the focus on self-determination and customization of supports, those relationships have to be there for that person to establish it. And to be clear, we have about um, 1,100 microboards in British Columbia, the province I'm from, and many of them are for people that have um, profound and complex needs. So often it will take us a while to find out how they indicate and how they communicate who are the people they trust and that they would trust to help them make decisions. So that isn't done lightly. We spend a lot of time figuring that piece out. Um, so that support network incorporates through our local government as a simple nonprofit, as I said, or non-governmental agency. And the intention of that is to work with the person to help them realize their own goals and what they want life to look like. Um, what I thought would make this easiest, since we have a, a tight timeline here, is to talk from the perspective of only one individual so they can explain what it was like for them. And Jeff kindly um, volunteered to be that person. He's actually a great person to choose because he's had a microboard, one of the two first microboards we created in BC nearly 30 years ago. And um, Jeff picked the people that are on his microboard and often will, will change the people on his board based on what he's doing in his life at that particular time. Currently, his brother, his sister-in-law, and three longtime friends sit on his microboard. And just to give context to that, the articles of incorporation for the microboard, they're not onerous, it's a fairly simple process, but they state right in them that the people on the board must be people that this person approves of having there and that they feel they're being supported in their decision making. So in effect, they can fire people on their board if they feel they're not listening to them and they're not supporting them like they um, intended it to be. And in fact, a number of years ago, Jeff did approach me about a board member that he felt wasn't listening and asked. He said, this says that I can tell them they're no longer on my board. And I said, that's exactly right. So what we did was I sat down and I said, if you really want them to leave, then you need to sit down and talk about that. Or do you want to work it out with them and explain to them that this has been a very important issue to you and you don't feel heard? which is what he chose to do, and that person's still on his board. I'll actually, he doesn't mind if I tell you. I'm not sure if his brother would want to know, but nobody knows his brother here, right? So it was actually his brother, and he felt that um, he just wasn't listening to him. And after we sat down and discussed it, his brother recognized that and said, I'm sorry, and, and um, they worked it out. But he does have the power, if he chooses to, to ask people to step down from his board because they're not listening to him. So the beliefs around microboards, we work from a very strong philosophy and um, functions for the microboards. And they're not just words we use, it's actually what boards, that what's made, uh, defines them as a microboard. So they're focused on the dreams of the person, their wishes, and what they say they want life to look like. So the board members have a commitment to figure, figuring that out with the person, what it matters to them. And it may not always be self-evident. Um, the microboard that I sit on actually, which is the other one that's been around for quite a long time, um, when we were first talking about where the person would like to live, she picked a community in, in the greater Vancouver area that's on a hill, and she lives in a, in a um, or she uses a wheelchair, and I thought, well, that's interesting, because everything, to get anywhere, you're going up or down a hill. It never occurred to me that because of her limited life experience, she may not have known communities in Vancouver, so I started thinking about it, and I thought, well, why don't we just go out and visit various communities, and then I'll ask the question again. And sure enough, as soon as she realized that community was on a hill, she decided not to, to live there. She chose a place that was flat, which made sense. Um, the other thing in her situation as well that she did was um, she wanted a place near a park where people played sports, and she wanted a shopping mall. Well, the shopping mall made sense to me. She loved to shop. That was a, a big thing for her, uh, part of her social um, experience. But I wasn't sure about the park, because I know she did not like to play sports. And when I asked her that question, I said, well, I'm you know, sure we'll find a place near a, a, a you know, sports field. That's not a problem, but I'm not sure why that is. And she said, well, I don't play sports, but a lot of good-looking guys do. And so, sure enough, she's a young woman. Why not? So we found her a, um, a place to live that met her criteria. So the boards really work to, to find those things that matter to people. And those are lighthearted ones, but there's a lot more important stuff that we really work on with people. And the members are in voluntary and close reciprocal relationships. So this isn't volunteer work. It's actually a relationship where both parties feel they're giving and taking to and from the relationship. And they're the foundation. That's critical for it. And it's set up for one person or one family. When we say one family, that's generally in Canada. If a child is under the age of consent, the microboard is established for the family because the parents are still the legal guardians. So the direction comes from the, the parents as the, if the child's young. And so how those work for Jeff? Um, 
he, his board helps him sort out what he wants to accomplish. He'll usually talk about what it is he'd like to do, and so they'll brainstorm with him about how to make that happen. In the picture here, what it is is Jeff wanted to go, um, we have a, an annual hockey um, tournament. Hockey is a big sport in Canada, ice hockey. Um, we all live and breathe hockey in Canada. And um, he wanted to go to, we have this famous outdoor tournament that's usually in some place this ungodly cold in the middle of winter, and he wanted to go. And so those are Jeff with members of his board, and they went to the hockey tournament in the next province over, and they were holding the cup from the winning team there. But the board doesn't say, oh, no, Jeff, you know, you're in a chair, and how are you going to stay warm, and oh, dear, these things are worrying for us, and, you know, you've got respiratory issues. They go, okay, well, let's figure out how to make this happen. And so together they problem solve so that Jeff can go. And, of course, the other guys had a horrible time, as you can see, that was really a difficult thing for them to do, but they managed to muddle through the event. Um, he's also um, uses his microboard members... Um, to help him with fun stuff like sports and things like that, help him with communications, because um, Jeff has CP and his mobility is severely restricted, voluntary mobility. They've helped him design a, a head switch that works for him, and um, that's really made life easier for him. So they work on those things together. So the beliefs of the microboard is it's about the personal relationships, respecting self-determination for the person, using uh, person-centered thinking to resolve and solve challenges the person faces, being involved in community, opportunities to give and receive in that community, and respect for each other. So with Jeff, his board members are family and lifelong friends, and they spend time having fun together, and they also brainstorm together, and they, they do activities together, um, not because they're volunteering their time, but because they enjoy each other's company. And they have a philosophy about support and caring, both paid and unpaid. So oftentimes, um, when the individual has a microboard, the microboard, if the person requires personal care support, the microboard receives the money from government that would pay for that support. And that way they can completely customize the supports and services the person wants based on what they're describing they want. So those services are provided by the microboard, but the individual is still at the center of the decision making around that. The microboard acts as a congruent and makes sure that pay payroll gets met, and those kinds of things, but the individual has the say so about who works with them. Um, and they're made up of committed board members that volunteer their time, they're advocates for the individual, they're also um, champions, so if the person doesn't feel they need advocacy, they just need somebody to encourage them, that's respected. And they can also choose to request funding, as I mentioned, and hire staff and create customized services. So in Jeff's board, again, he has staff that work for him, and he's picked them, he's hired them, he supervises them, but the staff and the board actually do the um, mechanics of it, the administration pieces of it, with Jeff giving final approval and, and when, after he's reviewed the information. As just some final thoughts from Jeff himself. I mean, you guys can read this, so I don't need to read it to you, but having a microboard has allowed me to live my own life. I make my own decisions with people I trust and have chosen to help me, which is what I, we all want for ourselves. Over the last 29 years, I've had the quality of life that I've always dreamed of. I don't know where I'd be if I didn't have my microboard, but I know I wouldn't have anywhere near the self-determined life I have now. Thank you. Linda, thanks a lot for sharing your long experience with this model. It's something like 30 years, isn't yes. it? Yeah. And for illustrating it for us with Jeff's story. So thank you very much for sharing. Petra, are you ready to draw the next picture? <coughs> so, um, wait, I put this away, so this is confusing. Okay, good. So microboards are no skateboards, and they're also not a computer solution but microboards actually consist of people. And those people are chosen by the person who wants to have support. And some of the principles are integrated in the drawing. Um, one is that the person chooses his or her microboard, um, who consists of, uh, which consists of people who voluntarily support the person, and they have close relationships. So it's mostly family, friends, and and other people who have really meaningful relationships to that person. Um, so the main focus is that the microboard together with the person looks again on the wishes and the dreams, what does the person really want, and then makes sure it, make, they make sure it happens. Um, if I understand it correctly, um, the microboards are also receiving funding from the government, and then the microboard together with the person 
in center, um, makes the decisions on where the money should go. And the person can also, for instance, pick somebody to pay, uh, to pay someone to do certain support. Is that correct? Okay, so to summarize it, a micro board is um, a, a summary of people or a, a group of people, um, most of them voluntary, but they can also pay someone to support so that the person can really live his or her dreams and be integrated in the community and be part. And I hope that's the main, main message you wanted to give us. Yeah? Great project, thank you. Uh, excuse me, can you show the PowerPoint? Yeah, I'm here. Where? Oh, there, okay. Yeah, so I would like to uh, see the PowerPoint slide um, of what she spoke just now. Can you just go, go back? back? Mm -hmm. Yeah, next slide. This one or another? No, one? next one. Next one. Next. Is that the one? Yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. Just a minute, we, we are just taking a picture. Okay, you want to integrate <laughs> that in your documentation of the conference. Very good, thank you. And next slide. And the next one. Okay, uh, here we no, go. Next. Next one? This yes, one. Yes, this one. Yeah. Hope you're taking it home and making it a good example in your country. Yeah, absolutely. Where, where are you taking it? Uh, to India. Okay, great. We'll see that microboards in India next year. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. We have a similar uh, exercise. We have trust. It is also legal. Okay. Uh, but what, well, sorry, uh, sorry, but we sorry. Have we to have to move to on. Uh, maybe okay. there is. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> good. So now we continue our journey to Australia. Uh, and um, JR will uh, tell us about their approach for supportive decision making. And I heard that there is also important international scaling up going on. Yeah. So we are curious to learn more. So thank you. Um, today I'm going to give you a glimpse of the transferable work that we've done in Australia, in Japan, and the work we've done there. So I'm going to be talking about the model and the skills needed to find dreams, not what people need, but what people want. Um, the program also looks at all possibilities and then it looks at what has to happen to make that happen. Next slide. So a little bit about the background. Obviously, Article 12 is the background of the program. And it started um, at the Office of the Public Advocate in Australia, and then it was further developed by myself when funding ran out. Japan learnt of uh, the program and sent a delegation to see if there was a suitability for it to be to, um, continued in Japan. And we started work about, I think, five or six years ago, and we began with conferences, workshops, and then we modified some of the things that we were doing in Australia to fit the Japanese culture and positions. Thanks. Next one. So the essence of the program. It's really about a facilitator who is paid um, forming uh, a team that uh, will become entrepreneurial for, for the person with disability. It works solely in express wish, hence me saying we work with what people want, what, not what they necessarily need. Because sometimes what they need is what people find is in best interest. It may not be, but it could be. Uh, it encourages people to think outside the box, to be really creative in their hopes and dreams, and to really think big. And I'll give you a little bit of an example of thinking big. We might, in um, talking with somebody ab ab about this approach, they might say, look, and we incidentally we work in the four areas of finance, accommodation, lifestyle and employment. And so the example is we might be talking to someone and they say, look, I'd really like to wash dishes in a restaurant. And so we would progress that conversation with the skills that we teach the facilitator to get into the stage of, have you ever thought of owning your own restaurant? Oh, 
No. And many of the people that we work with, and I mean that's a very quick jump from that to that, but obviously there's a time lapse between that. Many people have never really thought of thinking big like that. They confine themselves, confine themselves to what they think is possible for just their limited circumstances. So we encourage them to think big and we've had huge success with people. There was one man that was going to um, a day centre and he was great at art. Well, after thinking big, etc., he had his own art, art exhibition and he also went to university to do a creative arts degree. So that's just a, a few examples of how we think big. We also try to connect people to their local community. In, Austra in Australia and also in Japan, I think often what happens is if people want to do something, they try and find a service that is friendly to people with disabilities. We do a lot of work to tell them about what people with disabilities need. We don't do that. We actually, obviously the team will support that person to enter that local community. But we don't go there and make sort of special provisions and all that kind of thing. We do the support to the person with disability in, and the team that's working with them to, to do that. We also, uh, when we uh, had the training program for the facilitator, have a coaching and mental process so we don't just do um, a training process for the facilitator. We actually, for the next six months, when they're working with the person with disability to, to, to form their team, we have someone come, come and coach and mentor them with the skills and the model to make sure that they're actually... Because there's great models, but often we're not taught the skills and ability to perform the model and keep the integrity of what's happening. So that's a really big part of our, our, our work that coaching and mentoring on the spot with the person with disability. The model itself. Next slide. There's four phases in the model, and I haven't, I'm afraid, got time to go into it in, in any depth, but there's a recruitment stage, an agreement stage, uh, a building the team phase, and a exit and sustainability. So after the six months of the intense work, what will happen is the work, we do work to make the group sustainable and the facilitator will move on to another person and someone within the team will either continue the work or the person with disability will say, well, look, I know, I know all the support I need, I know how to access my community, I know how to think big, etc. I don't need it. So it can happen either way. When we work with people, it sounds a lot to work six months with one person and the team. When we're reporting to the funding body, I encourage people to think of working with the whole team. Because if you're reporting to your funding body that you're spending all these hours uh, with, with one person, it doesn't look so good. But if you look at what you're actually working with, and that's the whole team, it, it, it's much better for your funding body because you're actually working with all those people who are influencing other people. So it's a very conservative estimate, 17, because you're influencing people as you go along, as you're connecting to the community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's many influences um, in doing that. I think also the, the model itself is um, nothing without the schools. So although I'm presenting the model, please don't forget that it needs a suite of schools to actually get Express Wish. So we, we also train in that. So how is it innovative? Well, it works with anyone with a disability. We don't specifically target someone, uh, people, you know, a facilitator that's working with people with Down syndrome or mental health or any of those sorts of things. What I'm keener to do is for you know, people in Japan that, we're, we're, that I'm talking about today, they come with the expertise of working with those groups. If, if there does need ex, you know, expertise, whatever your thoughts are on that. So I feel they've got that thing. They come, they do uh, the training to, in the model and the skills, and then they go back and, and they themselves have the skills to know how that will work with the group that they're working with. So there's, we work with people with, that are nonverbal, people with really complex needs, etc. We feel that it, this model is really about the skill of the facilitator. 
Everybody has hopes and dreams. It's about us being able to open those hopes and dreams to, uh, to get them done. So it's innovative because it focuses on the skills of the facilitator. It's... The yellow one. OK. OK. Um, the coaching and mentoring is, is different, and it's very intense for six months. So what is the impact? People with disabilities think big. You know, they're not contained. People with disabilities think outside the box. They dream rather than looking at what they need. They look at what they might want. The community is, is, is influenced by what they see because the person's uh, very in the community. And our evaluation showed that there was an increase in courage, confident, confidence and happiness. Now, the where to from here is really important. From, uh, initially, we got finances from the Nippon Foundation and some universities. But from now on, what we're thinking is that Japan needs to take over their own, their own work. And I guess what, what they're going to do is they're going to do a train the trainer. And what they're going to... We're not right with the... We're not right with the PowerPoints, but that's all right. Um, we're going to do a train the trainer so Japanese people are, tra are training Japanese people. We're going to limit... I'm not going to be attending Japan. I've been going twice a year and doing the workshops. We're going to use uh, technology like Facebook and that kind of thing to do the work, and we're going to be telling the stories of people so people can see the results of it. And there's also a community campaign run by people that are, I guess, um, not working in the necessarily in the practice, but with policy and procedures so that the, that, that area is also um, done. Now, I'm going to end because 10 minutes is a really, really short time. And there's two people that I've brought with me that have been working in Japan with me. One of them is, could you stand up? One of them's Hiroko and one of them's Debbie. If you see either Debbie or Hiroko or myself during, during the course of the three days, please come and talk further about our program and we'd be happy to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, for completing our picture. It was very interesting to learn about this Australian perspective. And talking about picture, I would like to ask my colleague Petra now to present the, the last continent that we have on our map. Yeah. And it's a good example for um, know-how transfer from Australia to Japan, if I understood it correctly. <laughs> um, so there was a project actually first uh, developed in Australia and um, you managed to bring that to Japan and the first thing I heard was one of the, the challenges was to adapt the project um, to the Japanese culture of course. Um, so what does it do? It focuses really on the wants and needs, the wishes of people with disabilities. Um, so uh, actually it's more the wants and instead of the needs, because what you said is that if you ask persons what they need, it's always quite limiting. And your project actually requires people to think out of the box and to think big and have bigger dreams and bigger wishes instead of what do I need, but really what do I want and where do I want to go for. Um, so the whole project involves um, educating and training facilitators who support people with disabilities to achieve those wishes and dreams and wants. And you did that by an education program, so it's workshops and trainings, but also what you mentioned is a very long process of uh, coaching and mentoring for this facilitator, if I understood it correctly. And uh, it, what is also really important about the project is that it is um, it kind of involves the community. We saw a big graph on a lot of involved uh, levels. And what, what I heard was that in, uh, including the community and educating the community about wishes and dreams and wants of people with disabilities is um, one key issue, always adapted to the local culture. So actually the focus is um, people with disabilities who are dreaming and wishing and maybe they learn to be part of the community and learn to drive a car, what I saw in your slides, and do a job that nobody ever thought they could. So things are being made possible. Thank you.
Well, thanks a lot, Petra, for drawing this really fantastic map for us. And also congratulations to you all, my colleagues. Although 10 minutes is a terribly short time chair, <laughs> you made perfect time management. And we are really uh, able to uh, provide 10 minutes for questions or remarks uh, for our audience. Um, let me just say two things. Um, maybe we could show the entire map that Petra drew, like while we are inviting questions and remarks. And if you have a question or remark, please say shortly your name and where you're from. And if you want to address any specific speaker, please let us know. So someone is raising a hand back there. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm curious about the Israeli legislation on supported decision making. Um, so, as, as, as I understand it, uh, supported decision making in Israel does not uh, entirely, um, uh, entirely, it, it makes guardianship disappear, you know? If I understand, they, they coexist, you know? And um, I wanted to ask, um, what if the, the is everyone entitled to supported decision making, even those who might not uh, be able to communicate at all? No? And uh, uh, also, if if you could provide more uh, details about uh, how to prevent undue influence in the way Israel has um, regulated safeguards in their law, I would appreciate it. Thank you. My name is Carlos Rios from Human Rights Watch. All right, um, so first of all, um, to answer a complete answer, I think we can do that afterwards because it's a lot of details and we have a lot of information. We've translated the parts of the law relevant to this to English, so there's a lot of documentation. But I'll answer quickly to your question. Yes, unfortunately, guardianship is still there. What we have is a parallel regime where there is uh, support decision making and guardianship um, and uh, the court needs to choose the least restrictive measure which means needs to give uh, an advantage to support decision making. There is some, uh, adv there have been some amendments to guardianship. For example, even if you have a guardian, you, you retain your legal capacity, which is a question, how does that work? And the guardian, is supposed to uh, make decisions according to your uh, wills and preferences and not according to the best interest uh, unless you want to harm yourself and there we have the harm again and uh, what, what is harm and, and we see uh, a lot of time har like the, the red, red um, um, how do you call it, like the red card of harm being raised by guardians. Yes, please, Avital. So the percentage of guardianship is still increasing, and we have 28,000 of guardianships for people with disabilities and around the same number for elderly. And, uh, but this law is uh, relatively new, and I hope to see uh, better results and, and uh, decreasing the number of uh, guardianship that automatically being appointed uh, following this uh, law and following the uh, pilots that will be demonstrated of uh, using the decision, the supported decision making them there. Uh, although Yotam have presented a beautiful project and uh, I've seen some of the people who really made it in life, it's still relatively small numbers and we need to see it uh, uh, countrywide and, and, um, and then we'll be able to say yes we've managed to decrease the number of uh, guardianships, not only the, the total number but even those who get guardianships will, will have some more freedom and the guardianship's uh, authority will be limited. Thank you. More questions, remarks? Uh, I see someone in the very back with a white shirt or at least light blue, please. I think it's light blue, but okay. <laughs> so uh, I am Frank, I work for the European Network on Independent Living. And I have a question that kind of links to the last question. Um, I will focus more on the microboard example, but my question is indeed, how do you make sure that legal capacity is kind of 
it's guaranteed in a good way. Because I can imagine you have the microboard and then you work together to kind of realize the project of the people in control of the microboard. But my question is, does this person always have full legal capacity to make and challenge decisions of this board? Or is there some gray zone of influence by the board to then kind of force a decision on the disabled person? Thank you. That's a great question, and it's pretty complex. Um, so I, I'm going to give you a real short answer. If you want to talk about it a bit more later, I'm happy to. But um, the capacity of the individual isn't it's, this sounds strange, but isn't one of the priorities for a microboard. We do have systems in, in Canada that we use, and in British Columbia specifically, we have um, comma T ship, which is like guardianship, and we also have um, another system that we use in BC that's not as intrusive as comma T ship, because comma T ship is basically ownership of the individual, and then we, we have representation agreements, which are much um, more. Um, flexible around support. So those may be incorporated, not common T as a rule, but um, certainly the uh, representation agreement may be incorporated into the microboard model. But we also, within our articles of incorporation, are pretty clear about um, what the board's role is and how they assist the person. And we also work on a consensus model. So that means that um, the board has to kind of agree on the decisions, and if it's someone that can't necessarily tell you clearly what they want or don't want, the board works out how is our method of knowing? Like, what do we do? How do we figure out what this person's telling us? And do we have consensus on that's their communication? So they may require a fair amount of assistance from our staff for some time to make sure that that stuff is understood and supported. Thank you. Uh, I see a lady with a black shirt and a Necklace? <laughs> yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Cerasela Nicoleta Predescu, and I have a question for uh, Avital. Yeah? Uh, I'm interested to find out how you are working with people uh, who are institutionalized. Uh, is the staff institution allow you to go in institution? and? I would like to find out more details about how you work with these people. So uh, we don't uh, work directly within the institutions, although some of the institutions already collaborate with us. At the beginning, they really didn't want us to uh, penetrate to the institutions because they were afraid that they are losing clients. Uh, unfortunately, the situation here in Israel is still uh, where one person leaves the institution and the government still, appoint, uh, still uh, gives funding for another uh, person to replace him. We hope that this situation will be ended in the next two or three years. We really, we really want, uh, we hope that there will be a law that, uh, um, that uh, decreases the amount of people who are being um, appointed to an institution. But uh, our main work, and we see that this is the, uh, the crucial point, we work with the local municipalities and agents and uh, people from the welfare system in the local municipality, and we um, change their attitudes. Because in the beginning, they were the first barriers, because they are the one who decide whether the allocation will be to uh, um, independent living solutions or to institutions. And at the beginning, they told us that if we'll be man is it me who do this noise? Okay, so if we'll manage to take out people from institutions, it means that their first diagnosis was well. wrong and they weren't supposed to be there. So, uh, and now uh, we already have hundreds of people that we're taking them out. And, uh, and the institutions are starting to understand that maybe it's also better for them. I think that in the future, 
will be able to, once a lot of people will go out from the institutions, but still they'll be able to cater for people in the community for emergency services or for, uh, they have stuff 24 seven, so they can help people uh, from the community and be a resource to independent living in the community. And I think once we'll get there, the, their objection or their uh, antagonism towards independent living will decrease. Thanks a lot, Avital. Unfortunately, we cannot take more questions. We came to the end of our session. So I would like to thank all of you for joining and contributing to our session. And finally, I would like to thank again all our speakers and, and also Petra very much for their contributions. And I'm sure everyone is ready to answer more questions with you uh, in the coffee breaks or, or outside. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.